Hi, everyone. Welcome to lecture 25. Um, in this lecture, we're going to develop some basic properties of the integral. Um, and the first thing we're going to do is that we're going to prove that certain types of well-behaved functions are always integrable. Um, so obviously, integrability, so integrability is a weaker condition than continuity uh, in the sense that, right, um, well, as we'll prove, a continuous function is always integra integrable but an integrable function is not always continuous. Okay, so, um, you know, in integrable functions constitute a class of their own, and there are many you know, many ways for a function to be integrable. Uh, for now, we're just gonna prove that uh, two certain types of functions are always integrable. Of course, there, there will be more integrable functions than just what we talk about here. But uh, we're gonna show that, um, so continuous functions are integrable and monotonic functions are integrable. Uh, and then of course, there are more functions that are integrable, but we're not really gonna deal with them. I mean, that yeah. Uh, it's just useful for us to prove these types of functions are integrable because we encounter them a lot. So it's very convenient to be able to say, oh, this function's continuous, so it's automatically integrable, or this function's increasing or decreasing so it's automatically integrable so it's really uh, it's a convenience um, so uh, let's start with monotonic functions so this is theorem 33.1 uh, let f be a monotonic function on a, B, then F is integrable. All right, the proof is pretty simple. So suppose F is increasing, the proof for decreasing functions is very similar. Okay, so then note that uh, for any tk, tk minus one, tk, a subinterval of a b, um, that you know the the supremum of f on tk minus one tk is just equal to um, f of tk while the infimum of uh, f on tk minus one tk is equal to f of tk minus one, right? Because f is increasing, so it has to take its smallest value at tk minus one and its biggest value at tk, in a weak sense, obviously, right? So um, if we subtract, if we take, um, well, first of all, note, note that f has to be bounded, bounded above on a b by f of b and below by f of a, okay? So what we're gonna do is 
we're going to use theorem 32.5, right? So our strategy here, uh, show that the condition, the, the, you know, the Cauchy, you know, the Cauchy criterion of theorem 32.5. holds for f. Okay, so to do that, we're gonna let epsilon be greater than zero. And what we have to do is construct a partition which causes the upper sum to be, the upper sum minus the lower sum to be less than epsilon, right? So let's look at the difference uh, of the upper sum and the lower sum, right? This is going to be the sum from k equals one to n of m of you know stuff minus little m of stuff times t k minus t k minus one, right? I'm not going to. I just don't want to clutter up the uh, expression too much. You know what goes in in the parentheses here, but we also know that the capital M is equal to f of tk, and the little m is equal to f of tk minus one. Okay, so this equals the sum of. Oh, I see again. Um, the sum of uh, from k equals one to n of f of tk minus f of tk minus one times tk minus tk minus one. So here it's actually, it's actually instead of constructing a partition explicitly, so let's see, we're applying theorem 32.5. That's actually, let's see, oh yeah, okay. Well, whatever. It's, it's easier to actually just specify our partition just in terms of the mesh instead of like fully explicitly. So, um, so what we can do is, right, because basically uh, if this, so if we found this above by a constant, then it can factor out, then we can factor it out and we get the constant times f of b minus f of a, right? So basically, um, right, because once, once you factor out the like constant upper bound on tk minus tk minus one, you just get um, the sum of f of tk minus f of tk minus one, and that sum telescopes and you're just left with like f of b minus f of a, right? So, uh, so basically, I'm gonna erase this. So if we um, take p to be any partition of a, b with mesh of p less than epsilon over f of b minus f of a, then uh, u of f p minus l of f p is less than or equal to, right? This, this expression, so using this expression, right, we can bound this expression above by k equals one to n of f of t k minus f of tk minus one times epsilon over uh, f of b minus f of a, right? And that just equals, so this just equals um, epsilon. Because once you factor, once you factor out this epsilon over f of b minus f of a, the remaining sum 
adds up to f of b minus f of a. Okay. So um, there you go. That's uh, the proof that monotonic functions, well, increasing functions are integrable. Uh, of course, yeah, I mean, it's very simple to adapt this. You just flip the order of tk and tk minus one in this expression, and then pretty much everything else works the same way. Uh, so you can adapt this to decreasing functions too. So all monotonic functions, even if they're not continuous, remember, they might not be continuous, but if they're monotonic, they're automatically integrable. Okay, so let's also prove that um, continuous functions are integrable. So this is um, theorem 32.3. Um, any continuous f on a, b is integrable. So for this, what we exploit is the uniform continuity. So if you remember, actually, I think I briefly alluded to this uh, when we first discussed uniform continuity, that this is one of the, this is one of the useful, useful properties of uniform continuity is that it helps you control the error uh, between, or the, the, the distance between upper and lower sums for, um, for an integral. So let's see. So here's the proof. Uh, since f is continuous on a, b, it is bounded and uniformly continuous on a, b. Right, boundedness is of course necessary as well. Um, so uh, we're gonna, basically proceed with the same strategy. So we're gonna find a partition, we're gonna show that there exists a partition. Uh, so let epsilon be greater than zero. We want to show there exists a partition P such that U of FP minus L of FP is less than epsilon, okay? So how are we gonna do this? We're gonna start by um, picking delta such that um, if, yeah, x and y are in a, b, and x minus y is less than delta, then f of x minus f of y is less than epsilon over b minus a. So this is by uniform continuity that we can do this, right? You know, why epsilon over b minus a? Well, basically, if you think about it, right, we're bounding the distance between two values of f whenever two inputs are close enough to each other. And what we're going to do is we're going to use this to bound the difference between sort of between like the capital M and the little m of f on, on some interval, right? Because if we make mesh of P be less than this value of delta, then the upper and lower, you know, the, the supremum and infimum are going to be within this, whatever bound we put here, right, from each other. So if that's, so if we have some constant error bound between, on any like rectangle, right, the overall error between the upper and the lower sums on the entire interval a, b is just going to be whatever our error bound is for each interval times the length of the interval. So uh, times b minus a. So with that, that's why we want to choose epsilon over b minus a, right? So, uh, so then uh, let p be any partition with mesh of p less than delta, okay? Then consider any tk minus one, tk, a subinterval of a, b, right? Since f is continuous on tk minus one tk, it assumes 
a maximum and a minimum value on tk minus 1 tk. So m, uh, m of f tk minus 1 tk equals f of, let's say, yk for some yk in tk minus 1 tk. And similarly, little m of the same thing equals f of xk for some xk in tk minus 1 tk. Right. Then xk minus yk is less than or equal to tk minus tk minus 1, which in turn is less than, you know, less than or equal to the mesh of p, which is less than delta. So, uh, you know, um, the absolute, so, well, the absolute value, but we know which one's bigger. So f of yk minus f of xk is less than epsilon over b minus a. So u f p minus l of f p is less than or equal to, well, okay, it equals, right, this equals the sum from k equals 1 to n of, um, of f of y k minus f of x k um, times t k minus t k minus 1, which is then less than the sum from k equals 1 to n of epsilon over b minus a times t k minus t k k minus 1, which of course then you can you can factor out epsilon over b minus a and the remaining sums adds up to b minus a so the b minus a factors cancel and this equals epsilon. Okay, as we wanted. So uh, that completes the proof that continuous functions are integrable and um, yeah and then it, so in the next video we'll look at doing certain operations with um, integrable functions and showing that the results are also integrable.